Welcome to the gray area. The gray area media. We've obligated ourselves to be the voice for all communities speaking on topics that include community, religion, education, politics, technology, sports, health, and wellness. The Gray Area Media is a platform created by longtime friends for the sole purpose of providing our communities with the ability to voice current, past, and modern day issues. The Gray Area and its naming significance solely speaks to the area in which people shy away from speaking because of media-based constraints or contractual-based obligations. Well, I'm here to tell you, we don't do that here. So please, stay tuned in. We're going to go live in a few minutes. Don't forget, please add us as a friend on Facebook so that you can follow our live feed. And not only that, please add us on Twitter and Instagram at The Gray Area Media. Please visit our website at www.thegrayareamedialive.com. Thank you. viewers we're live right now on facebook and this is the gray area this is your boy ray e this is your boy p wills we have some very special guests in the building christine manina is back with us again former detective christine manina how you doing i'm doing fine thanks guys for having me again absolutely absolutely we're here with uh, some friend of ours that uh finally had a chance to get on the gray area most definitely yeah 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 with the uh, don't sleep organization the pacifist the pacifist <laughs> <laughs> You are the VP of uh, Don't Sleep, and you're the uh, community uh, youth liaison yes. uh, for Don't Sleep. Uh, Brandon Randall and Satchuel Cole. Did I say your yes. name right? Yes, you did. Okay. Been working on my... Uh, Her name is Nas right now. <laughs> my name is Jay. Thank oh, my goodness. <laughs> Her name is Nas right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> what we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Christine, you have been doing phenomenal with your... Uh, last time we talked, you were just starting uh, the Menina Files podcast. And it, it's it's growing fast. It, it is. It's starting to jump off. We're getting a lot of good, positive feedback with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. For the viewers who don't know, could you just give them a brief synopsis or description of what the Menina Files is and what your uh, in plans are f uh, for, the, for the show? Well, the Menina Files is a uh, show that kind of goes back and goes over all my homicide cases mm -hmm. uh, from beginning to end with a couple of... Uh, TMF specials that jump in, mm -hmm. uh, street stories when I was rolling around as a rookie on the streets of Indianapolis, mm -hmm. um, kind of ingrained in there. But it'll give you a, you know, a really good description of what life is like as a homicide detective and a police mm -hmm. officer in the city of Indianapolis. Wow. And I've had a chance to listen in on quite a few of those. Um, you know, what's what's interesting is, is like once you when you start listening to this and you guys go to the www.themaninafiles.com if you could now and put that on. If you got the Galaxy phone, shout out to uh, Android. You can watch us and watch the, you know, look at the All websites right. out there. Yes. <laughs> but um, I had a chance to listen in on a couple of those uh, segments and I was just amazed at the detail um, that you go into. You know, you really make help people feel like they're detectives and understanding what's going on on the detective side. Well, that's the goal of it, you yeah. know. And, and and my partner does a good job of answer or asking the questions and right. kind of delving deep into what it's like. Yep. And, Go ahead. I mean, do you ever worry, you know, <clears throat> you know, about a certain story that that you may go over that that someone might say, oh, you know, that was Tyrone man from down the street. Or, you know, like how, you know, they can probably like puzzle things and say, oh, you know, like she's actually talking and they'll find out which case, you know, that you are talking about. No, I'm not overly concerned. We, you know, we change the names and, uh, you know, okay. everything we talk about is public record. Yeah. So, oh, OK. Um, you know, we don't I don't bring up anything that's uh, not public record. So I don't I don't get too okay. concerned about that. OK, cool. Uh, awesome. Awesome. And um, so tell us what your plans are, because you, since it's growing so fast, are you guys planning on taking this to TV? Uh, you know, what's the next step? Uh, we absolutely are. You know, I think uh, it's, a, it's kind of a long process as I'm learning, but, uh, you know, we've definitely got some interest. And the next step is to take it uh, to television. And, you know, and like we mentioned before, you know, crime shows are very popular and, and networks are looking for content. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to jump on that as much as we can and try to get in that. 
Right, and you were a part of a few shows like The Shift, and can you name some of the other ones that you were a part of? Yeah, so two seasons on The Shift on Investigation Discovery, uh, last March an episode on uh, Real Detective, okay. and then back in my early days uh, was on Oxygen's Women in the Badge. Mm -hmm. Wow, got some accolades there. I mean, uh, you know, what's interesting is is that Indianapolis was a focal point. What do you think went into them finding you in Indianapolis? Was it... Uh, you know, I don't know. What What do you think went into them finding you here? Because well, there's so many, so many different places they could have chose. Indianapolis is not a, it's a, it's a kind of big city, but it's not a big city. You know, it's not Chicago, Miami, Atlanta. So what, yeah. you know, what do you think went into? Well, I think you know, for women in the badge, they went around the country and looked for women in law enforcement, and then the same production company that did mm -hmm. that started their mm -hmm. uh, another production company, and, and they kind of remembered me. But when they came for the shift at that point in time we were you know we were solving we were 80 percent solve solve rate in, up wow. in the homicide office mm. so that was Definitely. obviously an attraction um, we were getting it done so i think that was the main thing okay okay now back in uh let's see 2000 and around 2003 i think the uh the uh, marion county i mean we don't we could talk this or not but i just noticed that around the 2003 there was some issues going on with the dna solving back then you know where they were the, the, the DNA office was backed up so far, you know, and then they had uh, employees that were working there that were pressured, and they were just pushing them through, you know, and at some point they had to, you know, fire all those people. What do you? What happens when there's a situation where DNA is, is somewhat being tampered with and they have to do, do they let those, the uh, criminals go or, or assumed, presumed criminals? What do they do when mm -hmm. something like that is being tampered with internally? Well, it'll depend on, the, you know, what was tampered in, in the case. Um, yeah, the, the DNA thing back in the day, it's, you know, it got very much backlogged, sure. which is obviously not an excuse for people right. tampering them. But, you know, good attorney, once they find out, you know, DNA's right. been tampered with, um, a lot of times, uh, you know, the case will get thrown out if that's the main thing that, uh, you know, was in the probable cause to lead to the arrest. If, if, if all they had was DNA and it was tampered yeah. with, right. and a lot of times those cases will get dismissed and the, you know possible suspect will get released right so so whether a suspect did something or not because it was tampered with it's it's null and void absolutely okay okay cool um well obviously today you know we're still in some some pretty big tension between yeah. police and community when you were on the show last time you spoke big on uh you know people should do what's right you know understand between what's right and what's wrong and do the right thing you know and and we, we want to believe that, but just some, it doesn't seem like some officers get that. What do you think is, is happening, and what do you think should happen on that front? Well, I think, you know, like any profession, you're going to have your bad apples. Right. And with law enforcement, mm. um, you know, it's especially bad, I think, you know, when you have people out there that are, are not doing the right thing at the right time. Right. Um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a supporter or believer in mm. not doing it right because I've done it right for 22 years and when right. somebody does it wrong mm. you know it makes me look bad so I take it personal but you know I think they, they've got it they've got to be weeded out and they've got to be gone because once that trust is broken uh, it's very very difficult right. to get back and you know like I've said before and I'll c continue to say you know 95 99 percent of officers are really good and we're out here trying to do do what's right but you've got some you know that just don't do it right and it makes it bad for for everybody, for everybody else right now um you guys organization is is being really a huge you know, recently especially in indianapolis scene you guys really focus on um you know equality and and justice and accountability and that whole thing and could you guys go into uh what don't sleep is because there are people who are uh, not familiar with your organization mm -hmm. and this is a great time to let them know if remember with what you guys do and, um, you know, just tell them what you guys are doing. Go ahead, Vice President. <laughs> um, so uh, we actually formed Don't Sleep um, when we were fighting um, against RIFRA, um, which was a piece of legislation that um, Mike Pence was trying to um, pass that okay. would seriously limit um, and basically it would give rights to um, – Christians based on their religious beliefs, and it took rights away from those who were um, of the LGBTQIA2 plus uh, community. Okay. Um, so that's how we formed, but um, we truly fight any form of oppression. We're here for black liberation. Uh, we uh, here um, for, um, you know, uh, the LGBTQIA community. Um, just a lot of um, 
different things that we fight for. Mm -hmm. um, we have a website, um, naptowndontsleep.org, mm -hmm. and our pillars um, are on there um, that list, you know, the systems that we oppose right. as well as the pillars that we uphold. Okay. Uh, okay. So, I mean, what made you come up with the name, Don't um, Sleep? So I actually got to credit that to our president, Dominic Dorsey. Yes. Okay. Um, Dominic came shout up with the Shout out to Dominic. Yeah, yeah. Shout of out course. Out yeah. Dom. Hey, Dom. Um, so Don't Sleep is an acronym that stands for Deconstructing Oppression Now Through Solidarity, Liberation, Education, Equity, and Perseverance. Nice. So, okay. yep. Dom came up with that. So mm -hmm. it kind of just, um, in, you know, just encompasses everything that we stand for. Okay. Okay. Brandy? And we don't sleep, so like we constantly have Literally. to work against because yeah. the systems of oppression mm. don't sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. They're right. always oppressing us, so it's our job to not sleep and, and get these systems shut down because right. the and whole damn system is guilty as hell. Okay. The, the, a system? I mean, what are you referring to? Well, well, we'll, we'll go into that. Yeah. I want to give Brandon a chance yeah. to. So um, one of the other things that we do is, so each member on our team has a specific area of interest or expertise. Sure. So that's how we, it's like one big family, but we have such um, experience and background in these different areas. So like Satch does a lot of the work with IMPD. I do all youth related things because that's what I've done for 10 years is youth advocacy. Okay. Um, we have a national action chair. Uh, we have a mental health chair. We have so we we find the pillars of oppression, but we also find how we can infiltrate or get in those systems okay. and start breaking down those barriers. Okay. So we try to work within, work outside in, any way to get within these systems and start breaking them down and rebuilding them mm -hmm. or destroying them in general. That's what we look at. Okay. And what kind of events? Because I've seen a few and I've been a part of uh, a few, you right. know, with the Black Business. Um, you know, that was one of our first uh -huh. events since we've been doing podcasting. Um, you know, what are your events like and what are they, what are their, what is their goal? What is the goal for your events? Your well, we have different kinds of events. Um, so some events are planned um, and we have monthly events. Okay. So um, once a month we get together and do what we call Operation Care Kit, where okay. we make um, kits that contain, you know, like toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, mm. beef jerky, Pop-Tarts, you know, stuff like that um, for people that are experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, and we make mm. about 100 to 200 of those kits and then we take them and pass them out throughout the month. Nice. So right. that's an, an event that we do every single month. It's uh, uh, the third Saturday of okay. every month. Um, but then we do events based on um, what's going on in the world. So like right mm. now, um, we're doing a lot of events um, for the Aaron Bailey family. Sure. Um, since um, he was murdered by IMPD officers um, June 29th, um, we have had several events um, relating to his murder. Okay. Um, so it just kind of depends. Um, you know, we have a Santa sit-in um, because there was no black Santa in this city for black children to go get their picture taken with. Okay. So we created that for, um, so we do that. Um, we have the black owned business block party. Sure. We have the black owned um, business bazaar. Um, we have liberation weekend. Um, so there's just all kinds of events that we're doing um, just depending on what's going on. Okay. Awesome. Because I've seen quite a few of those and I think you guys have, you gotta always have like five or six events per month going on. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what is your goal for them? You know, are they, are they getting the, the, the point across of what you're doing? You know, what, what is the goal for them? Because I really want people to understand what right. you guys are doing and why you're doing it. You know, on the outside looking in, some people may say, oh, they're just out there doing this stuff. But, you know, unless they hear it from your mouth, right. you know, it's just another event that's going on. So we do, so one of our focuses is community collaboration. Okay. Because we feel that we are integrated into the community. So it's, there's not a separation. It's not don't sleep is working with the community. We are the community. Okay. Mm. So one of our goals is to make sure that everything that we do is community centered. Okay. Um, I know last week um, I was talking to somebody about the Aaron Bailey case and they were like, well, is it the activist groups are wanting this or the community? And it really bothered me because we really represent the community. We don't do anything unless the community has said, hey, okay. we need this to happen. Right. So we want to make sure that people know that. Like, this is a major collaborative event um, or collaborative effort. So, like, Ladies in the Construction, Bloom Project, Fable right. Car Glick. We can't operate as a silo because that's what institutions do. Sure. Um, mm. So we are trying to build this connecting network so we can rally the community to really look at equity concerns and destroy those that right. are problematic. 
Right. And um, he mentioned that you were working with IMPD. On what level are you working with IMPD? Are you working with... I, I don't work with No, IMPD. no, I'm not in that, in that sense, but... Yes. Okay, so... I just wanted to make sure that Okay, that's... sure. I don't work with IMPD. Um, I have done a lot of work to um, hold IMPD accountable um, and to let them know that the community at large um, is watching them, and we are watching what they're doing, especially on this Aaron Bailey case. We're watching even more what they're not doing and that speaks volumes. So I've gone through quite a bit of training um, classes that um, new recruits go to. Um, I've done ride-alongs, things like that, um, in, you know, within the IMPD structure. But okay. um, by no means am I working with IMPD. Okay. We are not buddies. We are not collaborating. We, we, you can't do that with a system that is currently oppressing you. So. But we are strategic. Yes. So That's what I was going to say. Because yeah. there has to be some form of of a relationship for that to be effective too, right? Yes, and I mean, yes, you do have to have a relationship to have, you know, that be effective. At the same time, IMPD has to be willing to come to the table. Okay. You have to be willing to own your mistakes. You have to be willing to admit where things are wrong. And if you cannot do that, we cannot move forward. And that's kind of the... I don't want to say the stalemate that we're at, but that's kind of like that's why the community perception of IMPD does not change and does not get better because the the actions of IMPD do not change and do not get better. Okay. Well, and, I'm sorry. Just one more thing. And, and just be clear because we've also had people um, who have suggested that we hopped on a bandwagon. So just to give some background, so we have been strategic. We've been. Um, building within law enforcement and the criminal justice system and other issues. So looking at how policing patrols, looking at hotspot policing, looking at um, the, um, the, the walking, the, um, when the police, the police officers are walking through the beats. Um, so we, we, don't, we haven't only focused on Aaron Bailey. We look at this as a, an institution or a systemic impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing work um, alongside these issues since we had since we were in um, the inception of Don't Sleep. So I want to make sure people people sure. know that right. Um, and that this isn't just for like notoriety or some sort of bandwagon effect. Right. This is what we are truly passionate about and what keeps us up. Like Satch literally does not sleep when it comes to Aaron Bailey. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Okay. okay. And that's and that's awesome. And we we all know a little bit about the Aaron Bailey case and and some things surrounding that and. Christine, I don't know how much you know about the case itself. I know that certain people are working on certain things, but you're there, you know, as a as an officer, and I'm sure you hear some things or what's going on. What are your What are your thoughts surrounding that case and what's happening? And I also want to speak on how we can try and build a relationship, you know, here because we can we can always be on the outside and have it, have an, a way of thinking about it, but we really have to figure out how to bring this together, you know, and even if um, even if we leave this, you know, with after just a discussion, the discussion is out there and people, we want hoping that people are willing to come across the table. So what are your thoughts on on the whole case? Well, I think, you know, I don't I don't know the specifics. I know what everyone else knows. Okay. So I'm not in any inside scoopage okay. Okay. Uh, of what yeah. happened. Sure. Initially, you know, what you hear, you know, it doesn't sound good. Right. It absolutely doesn't sound good. Um, you know, but without being there and, and knowing, you know, it, it's hard for me to, you know, make an opinion on it. But what I know and what I've heard and what has been, you know, shown on the news and, and things, it, it doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. It absolutely doesn't look good. Um, I think, you know, in defense of I, I'm never going to be okay with, uh, you know, shooting unarmed people. Sure. Um, you know, there's a, you just can't. That's just not cool. Right, right. Um, with that being said, it, it does take a process. It does, you know, just like any other time, it, you know, people will complain, you know, that, that these homicides, um, you know, take a while to investigate and, and to get an arrest and, and things like that. Same thing with this. I mean, these, these investigations take a while. I think, you know, in my opinion, you know, Roach jumped on it quick. Chief Roach jumped on it quick, and he, and he, and he talked about it, and he's as transparent as he can be at this point. But it's an investigation, and now it's in the prosecutor's, you know, hands. And you can't just like there were many times when I was in investigating homicides where the media would ask questions, and I absolutely wouldn't give information because it would hinder the investigation. So, yeah. you know, sure. uh, that's kind of where I'm at. 
with it without being there. You know, it, it's right. one of those things. But, you know, off, initially it doesn't sound great. Can you talk about the process that it takes? So, like, I know that you guys have been trying to push this to go to a different level and have a specific person or entity um, handle the case as, as a regard. How, how does that work when something like this happens and, you know, whether it's the public or the prosecutor and has to go to the next level because it's out of IMPD hands? How does that process work? Well, I think that, that that's happened. My understanding is they've got a prosecutor from another county. Okay. I, I, don't, I think it was Correct. Elkhart or we, we South Bend. Did, we did. Um, we held a huge – so I was going to say this earlier sure. when you okay. were saying about the actions that we do yes. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and are they effective? Yeah. Well, we got a special prosecutor. Absolutely. So in – we called Terry Curry's office nonstop. Okay. Um, we held online vigils um, encouraging people to call Terry Curry, post your screenshot for calling Terry Curry. Mm -hmm. We did mass calls to Terry Curry where sure. 100, 150 of us would call him at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so we did get a special prosecutor. He is from South Bend, okay. um, Prosecutor Cotter. Um, and, um, you know, that was our goal was to take it away from Terry Curry because – Part of the issue is the police are investigating themselves. So Terry Curry relies on IMPD officers <clears throat> to give him the information he needs about the cases he needs to prosecute. Terry Curry cannot do his job without IMPD officers. So when you have Terry Curry then investigating the officers that feed him information, that's it, it's just... It's not good practice. And that's why um, President Obama, in his 21st century policing, um, addressed this and said, you know, this, this case specifically falls under what he says we should have a special prosecutor for. Um, and that's why we wanted a special prosecutor so badly. Now mm -hmm. our next goal is no grand jury, because historically, when you send um, a case to the grand jury that's um, an officer shooting an unarmed black person, they don't indict. So that's why we're asking for no grand jury in this case as well. Why do you think that is? Because the whole true. system is racist. The whole system is racist. I mean, okay. I mean, just to be honest, okay, so if you look at where police started, how did, the, how did police departments even form? Post-slavery. Mm -hmm. they, they were, yeah, Slave correct. It, it wasn't yeah. post-slavery. It was during slavery. They were formed to patrol slaves. So that's where police departments were even formed. So when you start in a racist <clears throat> place mm. and you never reform yourself, okay. you're still racist. Okay. And that's that's a lot of that's what a lot of people don't get is that the system is racist mm -hmm. and you can put perfectly good people in there. Mm -hmm. They're now their actions will be racist. It's like if you have clean water. I have a whole thing of clean water right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have a dirty cup that has all kinds of dirt in it. Right. This water is clean as I'll get out, but as soon as I pour it in there, it's not clean anymore. And you can't okay. separate the dirt from the clean. Okay. And that's kind of like the these are officers that, you know, they were great before you put them in the police department. Now, So at a glance, you're saying, you know, to sum this up, you're saying that the system that was in place, that has been in place for, for years, even whether people are good or bad, they get to work Correct. for the, the officers. And even those who are good are working in a system that is still corrupt. Correct. And then not only that, but if you have good officers... <clears throat> Why aren't they speaking out to no end on the officers that aren't good? How come you've never not one time heard an IMPD officer on the news saying, this guy over here that's an officer needs to be fired. This guy is doing stuff that we shouldn't do. This guy, because when someone shoots police officers and it's attributed to Black Lives Matter, what's the very first thing Black Lives Matter does? We go out and we say on, mm -hmm. on every, every outlet denounce, that we can, we yeah. denounce that. We do not uphold violence against officers in any form. That's not okay. But you'll never hear that from IMPD. The day Chief Waters died, we sent emails to Chief Roach, to Ken Dale, to uh, Commander Spurgeon, expressing our deepest sympathies for their loss. Do you think one time ever when they have killed an unarmed black person, that they send an email to the family with their deepest condolences? Do you think that they give phone calls with deepest condolences? Do you think Tamir Rice's mother got deepest condolences? 
No, I, no, we don't. You know, I hear what what you're saying, um, and I could say the thing. I mean, I could say the same thing about black and white people in this country. You know, you may have. I mean, you know, this country was formed on racism, right? Correct. Okay. So if I put every white person in a box mm -hmm. and said they're all racist, I don't mm -hmm. want to work with them. But but there may be some in there mm -hmm. that want to work with us and help us. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there will come to a, a, a point where you would want to work with, you know, IMPD officers? Because I was in the eighth class. You know, I was in there for 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I resigned. Mm -hmm. um, really don't want to get into the, uh, you know, the details, but I was in there. And my whole point of wanting to become an IMPD officer was to get involved and help right. people because that's the core which is why we created this platform it's just who i am um and i know a lot of officers that that, that are good officers i mean relatives i mean she knows some of my uh, uh you yeah. know my aunt and my uncle good officers and and they do a lot so i just think that that perspective of saying that you know the system is corrupt yeah, you know, the people that control things, yeah, but if you can find a few and work, uh, you know, with them, you can build a bridge from from, from that point. Well, so it, I mean, you might disagree, but, 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 you know, I'm just saying, if I had that same perspective, mm -hmm. I shouldn't talk to white people then. But well, the yeah. well, let, me add, let me add this. I, I've been an officer for 22 years, okay? I, okay. I'm a good person. Sure. Okay, I was a good person when I started. I'm still a good person, and this yep. is why. Mm -hmm. I've solved 95% uh, of these homicides that I did, mm -hmm. okay? And probably 70% of the families still contact me, mm -hmm. okay? And I still stay in touch with them. That's awesome. And it's the relationships that you build with these people. Um, it's the type of person I am. So I can't say that, I mean, I think it's, it's difficult for me to comprehend that mm -hmm. I'm a good person, when I put when I put my hand up and said I'm going to be the police and went through the training right. mm -hmm. and and gone into a system that uh, you know that you feel is is corrupt and and now I'm not a good person I you know I I know I'm a good person I've saved lives out here but that's right. the difference Absolutely. is that you we are not saying you're not a good person you're taking you as a person right. and you can't separate that from your your occupation. So I can be... No, but I can, but I can separate. That's what I'm saying. Is but that. that's what I'm saying. We're not saying you're a bad person. Right. And that's what you keep saying. I'm a good person. I, I'm not debating whether you're a good person or a bad person. I don't know you. So you probably are a really good person. There are no good officers. You're talking about that, the, the system. That, that, I, I disagree with that. But that doesn't make any sense. You can't yeah. sit here and tell us that there's 1,700 bad officers on this department. I've been on for 22 years. You will look at my file. There's not one complaint. I have not been in internal affairs ever, and I have never worked around an officer that I felt was bad because I wouldn't lose my job. I wouldn't lose my pension. So if I'm next to an officer that's doing some shady stuff, I will, I will be the one to say because I'm not, not about to go down for anybody. So, so and, you're, and, you're lumping and, all of us in to that we're bad officers. That, that's absolutely yeah, I, I, asinine. I, I, it's asinine. Yeah, I disagree with that. I, I'm sorry. I have to, I, and, you know, look, you're entitled to your, you know, your own perspective. I mean, that's great. But like I said, you know, I can use the exact same analogy with, with black and white people. I can say I'm, all, I'm speak on that. I can say all white people don't like black people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to white people because the history has proven the system that we were brought here in slave ships you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I could say all white people, you know, just basically stripped us of our history and everything. So why even deal, you know, with white people? I mean, but I don't have that mindset because I was always taught you judge a person by their character, regardless of what system that they're in. Now, they may be limited. Like, there's certain things that my aunt can do and, my, you know, and my uncle or she can do. But they have to answer to certain people. But I think with what y'all are doing, I don't think there's a problem if there was like a meeting and you wanted her to come and talk or you wanted my aunt to come and talk or get get involved in a, you know, you know like in some type of event to bring people together. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think that would be an issue with her or, so, or even but, my aunt. Right. But see, but at the very beginning, when you when you spoke, you're like, I got to make it clear. I'm not hanging with IMPD. 
I'm not like that with them. I'm not friends with them. So you're in an organization that's trying to make change. Correct. Okay. But you've already put out right at the very beginning, I'm not hanging with these people. I don't like them. I'm not hanging with them. I ain't going to talk to them. There's absolutely no way that we can bridge it. That's what I said. If I wasn't going to talk to y'all, then I wouldn't have sent an email to Commander Spurgeon, Chief Roach, blah, 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 blah. That's what I'm saying. So let's let's not make it more than what it is because I I, I did not say that. I, I So I must speak on a few things. So... Your, your analysis on black and white people. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important because I'm reading the comments. You know, some people are. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Some people are. Oh, yeah, they're disagreeing like crazy. But, but, yeah, just, but I think so. it's really important to understand first the definition of racism. So racism is racial prejudice plus power. So when we look at institutional power in this country, people of color have never been granted equitable access to that power. Okay. So. When we look at when we talk about institutions are racist, systems are racist. It's because those institutions have been built upon white supremacy okay. and a racist um, ideology. Okay. So in your comparison with white and black people, so this is going to probably uh, not make some people happy, but to say that all white people are inherently racist is kind of true, because when you look at what racism is, and when you look at white privilege, so it is the role of white people to look at your white privilege, acknowledge that it's there, and then start working to deconstruct the systems that we benefit from, like policing. So I have two degrees in criminal justice. When I was going through my last couple classes, I look around the room, it's almost all white people. But the mindset of the people that were in that room was still very racist. Like when you hear what they're saying, what they're wanting to do, So as white people, we have the onus, we have the responsibility to look at systems. Like, if I were a police officer, and I'm like, okay, I am choosing to work within a system that I know is inherently racist and was built upon white supremacy. So how can I start working from within to deconstruct that system? I've worked in education. I've worked in nonprofit. It's the same mentality. So we have to be able to look as white people on how we benefit from institutions, but also how do we use our privilege and our access to deconstruct. The second thing is it's important to take this from a local level to a national level. While the focus here in Indianapolis is Aaron Bailey, this is a national issue and it didn't start with Ferguson. It's been happening. So it's really important to understand that it's not the individual officer. It is the system that they are operating within. That's why I I don't like the phrase, there's, you know, a few bad apples. You can't talk about bad apples when the whole bucket that is holding the apples is corrupt. And I think that if you are a part of an institution like that, you have to have some sort of understanding. You can have that duality mindset. I want to do good. I want to be that officer. But you have to also be real, especially as a white officer. You're working in a system that targets people of color. That's not... um, posturing that's not conjecture that's not false assumptions that has been proven that is facts okay but look as a black man i can sit here and say that the declaration of independence did not include me or my people it didn't oh okay but i mean i could say that right Mm -hmm. okay so that's the system like that that basically said this is you know now we have this country that declaration of independence the national anthem all of that i can say none of that had me in mind as a citizen it had me as chattel Mm -hmm. in mind right but where would that get me i mean how how far would i i mean like if i if i carry that i mean i I wouldn't deal with certain people but that's the thing is that you're talking like it's something that happened that is in the past that we have worked no, no, to get through. No, no. So it's never it's it's never been that we absolutely will not talk to IMPD, that we don't want to make changes, blah, 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 blah. That's not correct at all. When we went to IMPD mm-hmm. um, two years ago mm-hmm. with um, a list of things that we thought were um, – basically a list of demands that they should change. Um, transparency being one of them. I mean, it's a it's a petition that's been online for a while. Um, this was back when Height was still, um, you know, the chief, um, before Roach even, you know. But we have gone to IMPD. We have tried to 
bridge that gap and, you know, all of that. But when IMPD refuses to come to the table with legitimate changes or any kind of acknowledgement of where they have issues that need to be changed, then where do you go? You know what I'm saying? It's like if you have someone who's been beating you and then they just show up one day and they're like, okay, we're going to move past this now. You're not just going to move past that. You're going to be like, no, I need an acknowledgement from you of what you were doing wrong. I need an acknowledgement of what you're going to change. And until we get that from IMPD, especially right now, because, I mean, y'all just shot a man mm. and killed him. Mm. And it's been almost, what what day is it, 60? Okay. Okay. Um, like, in 60 days, you haven't even... You, they haven't even bothered to meet with the family again. Mm. They, they, they actually backed out from meeting with the family. We had it set up for them, and IMPD backed out of it. So where is the transparency here? Okay. That's what I was going to say. That I, I definitely believe that transparency is a big deal when it comes to community and policing. Right. There has to be some form of fashion of it. Um, just today, um, it, this story is just developing, so forgive me if I don't know it all, but um, an officer said some, some crazy, pretty mm -hmm. crazy things about, you they know. They only shoot black people. They only shoot black people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know. I mean, things, do you think that's true, that they only shoot black people? Okay, uh, but no, but no, that's I mean, the mindset. That's, okay, that's what I'm trying to explain, is that it isn't. No, they don't only shoot black people. We absolutely know they shoot white people. Heather, uh, not Heather Hare, um, what was the, what was the white woman's name up uh, north? I don't remember her In name. Minnesota, I think. Um, yeah, I know who you're yeah, talking okay. about. I forget so, her name. Um, no, I mean, we know that they shoot white people. I mean, the the dude that just shot um, Lieutenant Allen, you okay, know, now, he got shot too. Now, do you see that on the news? A white officer shoots another white or a white unarmed person? I mean, I mean do they put that on the news? I mean, a lot? Yeah, because they, they got charges against mm -hmm. that dude within 48 hours. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you do see. Because if it's, if, if that's what I'm saying, it's not. <laughs> right. I mean, the reason I brought that up was because I I looked at the chief, the chief, the police chief in that mm -hmm. case. And they they got on air. Mm -hmm. They denounced it. Mm -hmm. They're being very vocal about not being a part of that. And, and, and you could tell that there was some edge because you don't want to be the chief and then these be your people right. you know doing wrong so at some instance you have to defend them but that you just can't defend that you know so right. you know I, I do applaud the chief for getting up there right away and being transparent about that and denouncing it and i think that that's really what the community wants the community just wants someone to come and say look we know this is wrong we're working on it and i think when you don't get that that's when the, the pushback comes the is that what you're trying to the say the community so, like, also wants action though Absolutely. Because in that case, he has been, that happened in July of 2016. He is on administrative duty. So the fact that a dash cam caught him saying that, he's, I understand that there's still This a happened process. in 2016. Yeah, so a yeah. year. And he, he was just one that got caught. So the community, the community does want transparency, but the community wants action. We don't want administrative leave. We don't want administrative duty. We need termination. We need indictment and we need charges. Because until that happens, then it, like Sash said with the grand jury, it's the same old thing. We can't get excited when somebody goes to a grand jury or is even arrested because history shows that even though they're arrested and they go to a grand jury, no indictment or no, no time served. Or like um, Oscar Grant, there was time served less than a year for involuntary manslaughter. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at, we need that, like action. We need tangible solutions and I, we need police departments to make those actions, but then issue reforms and make changes that will directly um, not target communities of color, like the hot spot patrolling or mm -hmm. stop and frisk or um, a lot of these other things that because the disproportionate numbers of the people that they are um, uh, targeting, like we have to look at that. And like when we say, yes, white people have been shot by the police, we know that. But disproportionately, they have not been. So when you look at the population numbers of people of color. Right. 13% black people. But yeah. And so, the most. so can you can't really use the argument that white people get killed by the police as well because they are absolutely not being killed at the same rate. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I'm sorry. But I mean, and I, and I hear you. But my whole point in saying that, man, is this. 
they don't push that on the news as much as a white officer would kill a black guy, right? So wouldn't you think that maybe that's the system that's trying to cause some type of more or more uh, attention between blacks and whites by just like flashing that on the news more and more? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's like some conspiracy or setup. I mean, they really are killing black people. In 2015, there were 102 yeah. unarmed black people killed by the police. 102 unarmed. Two officers were indicted. Two. I, just let that sink in for a minute. There are 100 people out there that are dead. They had no weapon, and an officer killed them and walked. Not, not just walked, didn't even get arrested. I think that there's a few, there's a few things. This is just my opinion. I think that there's a few things happening here. Okay, we if we go back to talking about the system itself, right? Mm -hmm. The training that was applied to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go back even further than that, because when after slavery was no longer a a, a lawful thing, um, <laughs> after it was. Slavery Supposedly, still happens right now. Yeah, yeah, Slavery yeah, yeah. hasn't stopped. And I, that's, I understand that's that, the misconception. I'm, yeah, but I'm well, getting somewhere. I'm getting somewhere. Well, not hard bondage, but man, right, right, right. I hear you. Right, but I'm getting somewhere. Let's let's go back to when um, black folks were pushed out of these uh, fields and given put in, in areas where they were supposed to operate, you know, normally. Okay, there was no transition for that. Um, you know, they're now now called ghettos. Um, we always use the analogy: if you put rats in a in a in a box together, after a while they'll start eating each other and killing each other because they're trying to survive. So I think that on one end, that is a something that's happening that's never been addressed, um, and I think that there just definitely needs to be some reform around rebuilding these neighborhoods and rebuilding the confidence in that. Another thing I think is happening is when the training was applied to to uh, being a police officer, or back then when it, it started policing areas or whatnot. Uh, because of what happened prior to uh, this policing thing, I, I believe that we were natural targets, right? Okay, these people are loose. We don't know what they're going to do. You know, so, and, and I'm saying that, I'm not saying that all the training that was applied back then is being applied now, but I do feel like there are remnants of, of, of that training Absolutely. still here. Absolutely. And, and, it, Absolutely. and it, because when officers and there are a lot more white officers than there is black officers. But being 13% of the population, you always, that's always going to be, you know. Right. Uh, so, so the thing now is, is because we're only 13%, there's no way we could all be a part of a police station. There are probably some areas in the, in the country where there's mostly black officers, but as a whole in the country, there's probably a majority of white officers. So if you look at it like this, a, an officer who has never lived in an urban neighborhood or grew up in an urban area, Naturally, he's getting this training. When he gets training, he's going in as a person who knows nothing about being an officer, but he's shown these images and these targets of people who are supposedly rough, you know, thugs or what, what not. Right. So a lot of this is re reconstructive training. You know, and the system, I don't think, being in this country, I really don't ever think that the system is going to get dismantled like it, it probably should uh, in aspects of the training. I think that um, when you when you start killing people who are, um, you know, not even, what do you call them? Uh, I'm not disabled. What do you call people who are Ment mentally challenged or whatever? Uh, there has to be a way to identify yes. who you're dealing with mm -hmm. because, in essence, it seems like, you're dealing with this person, you know he's sporadic, but now it's being all grouped in, and right. he's just another thug, you know? So is, is it training? What is it? What, but even can beyond we... that, I mean, it so is it is training, yes, um, because, and mm. in, in one thing that we hear more and more and more from IMPD when we talk about implicit bias training, specifically racial bias training, um, you know, time and money. Time and money. Where where are we going to find the time for mm. all of these officers to go through this training? And where are we going to find the money to do it? Um, you find time and money for these officers to get paid every week and to do whatever other things you want them to do. If it was important, you would find the time and the money. 
you absolutely would. There shouldn't be excuses on racial bias training. There should be none. If if IMPD was serious about this bridge of community, you know, let's let's bridge this community gap. The very first thing that they would do is implicit bias and racial bias training. The very second thing that they would do is reach out to the community and go ahead and embrace Black Lives Matter. Because the longer that they refuse to acknowledge Black Lives Matter, the more issues we have. And that's something that I've discussed. In, in detail with several different officers um, and in in talking to them asking them why you won't embrace black lives matter um, and that answer is always 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 all lives matter that's that's what right. you get from officers is all lives matter now I'm with you on that like when you know and I mean I say this uh, you know by me being a black man every time it, it, or it, it seems like every time black people are trying to unite and do something good, it's always bunched into something else or, oh, you, or, you know, just leave that, you know, just, you know, like black lives matter. No, all lives matter. It's like, you know, um, you know, ignore it. So I do commend y'all, man, for being white people that really want to, you know, help, you know, not, not only us, but, you know, uh, you know, other people. But my thing is, is that, and I highly suggest this, that you find good officers to work with on a local level. You know, look at it, you know, like the government. You know how, um, um, I mean, you said that you try to, you know, reach uh, uh, Chief Roach. No, go to the officer that okay. is in so, the street. So I actually live, like, where I live is Willard Park. I live, okay. like, just a few blocks from 10th and Rural. Okay. okay. My son goes to a school literally around the corner from 10th and Rural. Mm -hmm. um, that's my hood. That's where I'm at. I'm the president of NESCO. So I'm highly invested on the mm -hmm. near east side. 10th and Rural, uh, the New York and Sherman, that whole mm -hmm. area is so over-policed. It's ridiculous. I know yeah. more officers on a first-name basis. Is that a high-crime area? In, in, in that area? Yeah, it, okay. okay. Yeah, but, that's a high-crime yeah, area. But yes and no. Okay, so it depends on what you, what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look at, so one thing that IMPD decided to do is that they were going to do some trials on the 10th and rural area. Um, and this came about um, because they were doing the rolling stop and frisks um, over at 38th and Post. Um, yeah, you know, 42nd and Post yeah, and all that. And all of that. Yeah, um, and so the, the officer involved shooting right there in the marathon. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There was an officer involved shooting there, mm -hmm. and they emptied, what, 200 rounds um, within like a, just a you know a few feet uh, that was just, of a um, yeah, separate one. But, yeah, mm -hmm. when there was a, a chase um, from like 71st and Georgetown mm -hmm. over to basically like Washington and rural, and mm -hmm. they emptied 200 rounds. There's a daycare on that corner where they emptied 200 rounds for a single suspect. So we are so over policed in our area that it's ridiculous. But they don't bring in what is actually needed. We don't need more police in that area. We need mental health services. That's what we need. We need food. We need jobs. I mean, we live in a food desert. You can't get, you, at 10th and, 10th and Rural, there's a grocery store that sells chickens, whole chickens for $23. Wow. I mean, we can't buy food. I mean, but but we can we can find 500 officers. Christine. But, but but who's accountable for that? For for there not being like jobs or 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 uh, businesses in in that area. It's it's well. Who's accountable? You it, know. It's quite a it's it's quite a few things that that all play into all of it. Okay. So it's not just one thing. Um, and that's the thing. When you're over policed, when you have so many officers in one area that you feel like you can't even breathe, people start getting like get oh, off. Oh yeah, that, me. I mean that's get statistically proven. Me. Yeah, that when so, you know when you group a bunch of people together that are trying to survive, right. this is this is what creates high crime areas. Because and, satur and saturation has been proven to not be a deterrent. Right. So right. policing patrol by oversaturating neighborhoods. It's not a, a it's not a deterrent. Like there's research out there that shows that, and Satch made a good point because I don't think that anybody's insinuating that we want IMPD to fix all of these problems. Like you can't IMPD can't fix homelessness or food deserts, but that's why we say we have to look at this systemically and as an institution. Like you have to look at what areas of town are not being supported by the local government by law enforcement. So when you look at the Near East side, because I live down the street from her. Um, on Washington and rural. So it's a food desert. 
You have high um, prostitution, high drug area, which is why New York and Sherman is even a hot spot. So it wasn't a hot spot for violence. It was a hot spot for mental health runs, okay. um, non-emergency runs. Um, so when you look at these areas, it's like, okay, why do we see an oversaturation of police patrolling, not community resource officers, but actual patrolling? So it would make sense if we saw the community-based officers in a more proportionate amount offering those resources, talking to um, Westminster, talking to Outreach, talking to all of these local organizations saying, how can we build with you? But there's such a divide that it, because you, you don't see that. You don't see that um, relationship building as much as you see patrolling. There are officers out there trying to build relationships. I'm not gonna discount that. But there is an over-representation of aggressive patrolling and not building the relationships that Christine was talking about. Um, well, the start right if, here. Let's okay. say name right. And, and see, that's yeah. the thing okay. is that it's not that we are like, no, you know, fuck <clears throat> IMPD. Well, okay, we are, but, um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. there I mean, goes. Like, but that's what I'm saying is that, uh, and we keep saying this, and it seems to get nowhere, is that until we get an admission of where you're wrong. We can't move forward. It says. That's, but that's but, the but what's right about saying fuck IMPD? What's right about that? Okay. Um, so when you look at how we are policed, okay, and when you look at an officer, okay, so I'll give you an example of um, when I was pulled over, uh, I want to say three months ago, three, four months ago. So I'm um, pulled over at 10th and Rural, where I live. Um, and at that time, I had a boyfriend, and he was in the passenger seat. And the officers came up to the window and asked me for my license and registration. I hand it over. And then, and then it starts. They want his. And I'm like, he's not even driving. And it's like, shut the fuck up is what he says to me. And then the other officer is saying all these things like, oh, is that, you know, how do you guys know each other? And he's like, that's my girlfriend. And he's like, Oh, how long have you guys been together? Why is this any of your business? Like, this isn't what you do on a stop. This is not professional. And so then it's like, oh, we've been together for, you know, like six months. And he's like, oh, six months? You got her pregnant yet? Because that's how you guys generally do it. Wow. So it's like, so when, when you're talking to us and you're, and you're very first response, like when you pull us over and it's like, shut the fuck up and this and that. And it's always the aggression. It's always this. It's always that. And it's like back up and you get to a point where you're like I, I can't anymore I can't and you just okay so very very good very good way to put it Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a riot is the language of the unheard y'all ain't hearing us y'all ain't hearing us until we say fuck IMPD that's when you hear us I mean, you, you didn't, you, you guys, and I'm not saying you personally. No, no, I know, I know. So, no, so I, when, when I sent the email, so I'll say this. When I sent an email to Chief Roach saying, hey, this situation happened and we need your help on it, no response. When I sent another email to Chief Roach saying, hey, Aaron Bailey, no response. No response, no response, no response on email after email after email. But the minute I send one saying condolences on Chief Waters, 15 minutes later I get a response. You can't say nothing to me about dead black people but you can absolutely respond to me about Chief Waters. And, and you know so what? You get that, to. And listen, that's a problem. And I'm, a problem. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So your frustration gets you to the point where. Well, and, and, so and this that's is, why I'm like, if we can, if we can say this is where IMPD is wrong, and IMPD can admit that and embrace Black Lives Matter, we can start building. Look. We can start that bridge. We can we can actually look at that bridge. Right now, I want to burn the bridge to the ground. Okay, well, that, that I mean, I want to take some from, from Michelle Obama. When people go low, you got to go high. And how, how long do you want us to do that for? 400 years hasn't been I, I don't long? know. I don't know. But, 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 your, but your approach and, and the way that you're doing is not, you got to go high. You got to go high because I guarantee if I pull you over, you know, it, it, it will be a different experience. So you've got to go. I understand your frustration. I was pulled over today. Okay, well, I'm saying. I was pulled over three weeks ago. Okay, well, something's going on. I was getting pulled over. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know what you're saying. case, and I'm the, I'm, I'm okay. one of the main well, people I, on the Aaron Bailey case. No, I, I understand. I understand your frustration, but what I'm saying is when people go low, you got to go high. And if you're going to. Uh, you know, if if you want to fight, I just feel like if you're going to fight these battles, let's go high, because I'll go high. I'll come to one of your meetings after you've Thank sat you. in Thank here you. and said Thank "fuck you. IMPD." Thank you. Thank you. I'll Thank go you. high Thank and come and 
one of your meetings. So it's just got to be a point where, you know, everybody's frustrated. You know, everybody's frustrated. Black Lives Matter is frustrated. The police are frustrated. You're not, you're not frustrated like you're going to die. You're not frustrated like... Are you if, kidding me? If your kid is pulled over by a cop today, you're not... You're, like, no, 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 sweetheart, that's sweetheart. That's I've been in I'm many not, situations. Oh, my name is Satchuel. I'm not your sweetheart. I've been and in I don't many. Know if that's a thing that y'all do, but the officer that pulled me over three weeks ago in the McDonald's drive-through called me sweetheart okay. as well. I'm not your sweetheart. But let me just tell you, I've been in many, many situations where I've been fighting for my life. So yeah, it's hard to be the police out here, and I have I fought agree. for my life. I, mean, I can't even tell you how many times. Yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. saying is, what I'm saying let's is you're, go high. Let's you're not, go high. You're not going to be afraid when you get pulled over by a cop. You're not afraid if you if you move that that cop is going to shoot you. You're not afraid because of a cop. You absolutely aren't. And at any minute, you can drop that badge and walk away. You know what? That's, that's not the same for people of color. No, well, they can't. No, they can't. You no, know, I understand. Their, I understand no, your frustration. Like I you do understand no, your frustrations you, to a degree. No, you don't. That's what I'm saying. You don't. You don't. But you if don't. I didn't, I, yeah, I do. Because if I didn't understand the frustrations. Okay, it's not frustration. The fear. The absolute fear. Okay. Okay. The I've, absolute I've, okay, well, well, fear. Okay. Well, 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 then, well, well, then look. Why don't y'all start from here? It's but no, like it can be y'all. It could be you two and her. And, and right, we, we have to you know. just start something right. right now. Right, we have to find a way to bridge this because you're. And, you, and that's what I'm saying. So like, y'all can start something right now with you three. Whether it, you know it's a meeting or something. We've done that. Okay, no, but you haven't done it with her. How many officers do y'all want us to do this with? See, look, look. But, and, that's, look. What but that's what I'm saying. Truly, how many? Okay, one. We work full-time jobs. We're not like the officers that get paid to do that. We actually work a full-time job. So this, this is this is not a paid gig. That's, and, that's semantics, and when and man. when, and that, when you have taken your time, I have taken so much time. I have gone to IMPD trainings at the IMPD um, on Post Road, the training center there. I have done ride-alongs. I have done all of this over and over and over and over. We have held meetings with IMPD, gone to their tables over and over and over. How many times do okay. we do that before IMPD reciprocates? I think, I think okay, so, so the answer is to just get rid of, uh, of officers or just not work with that, the officers. That's not what we're saying. Once again, when does IMPD want to uh, own that's what we keep. We, we just okay, keep okay, okay. That. And, and listen, I'm with it? you. Look, I'm look. I'm I'm really not disagreeing with mm -hmm. you. I'm not. Mm -hmm. But you want IMPD to listen, right? Here's an IMPD officer who just says she'll come to a meeting or whatever you want to do. Why don't? Okay. Why aren't y'all willing to start yeah, from me? Open okay. to that. I mean, it, it's one. It's not that we're not open. We've done it a million times okay. before. We'll do it a million times again. Okay. No, but, but just but, like but just it's like not with a Chase Lie Day, and it didn't go anywhere with Chase Lie Day. Just like with Kendale Adams, it didn't go anywhere. With Kendale Adams, it didn't go anywhere with Chief Roach. It didn't go anywhere with Chief Height. I mean, like I can name all the. It didn't no. go anywhere with Nate so, over at the okay. training center. It didn't go anywhere. So, it's so like when you keep so, telling me go high, okay, so I can't so, go much higher than Roach. So if okay, no, no, I mean go high, like go high. Let's so, go high. Like, like, no, I mean, so, I mean but I'm, I feel so, you. You, so, you just want me to never get frustrated and never, no, 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 no. never lose it and always continue to be the upstanding person and give y'all the benefit of the doubt and blah, 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 blah. Like, I, when y'all say fuck you to me, you still want me to be like, yes, officer, and I'm not going to do that. Like, we're not there anymore. Well, maybe so, some officers abuse their authority, okay? I'm with do. you, man. A lot that. of them do. But A to lot say... Of them. Okay, well... When, when I have yes. officers that I... Okay, so, like, you know, when I have an officer that I'm at uh, Texas Roadhouse a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, Aaron... What's Aaron's last name? I don't even remember. He's a, a east side uh, beat. And um, he was there off-duty, and he saw me. He was like, hey, Satch. And I'm like, hey, Aaron, you know, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And he's with another off-duty officer, and they're not in uniform or anything. We're just having a conversation. And I'm like, if we offered a class that, you know, or, or a discussion that... IMPD officers could come to to learn about Black Lives Matter because what I found out is a lot of officers haven't even gone to the website don't even okay. really know what Black Lives Matter is about if we if we did something for y'all to come to would you come to it do you know what every single officer has told me that's a waste of time I have a question sure. have and I don't know so I'm sure. asking sure has there any be I mean ha, has there ever been any Black Lives Matter member 
that posted a picture with an officer and just put it on like Facebook or YouTube or you know whatever. So here's so, a, so all the times that I post where I'm at the officer training. Or I mean, that's I'm, why I'm asking. Yeah, I, I do. Like if you went, like I, I know that you. I, I, I don't. Know, we might not even be friends on Facebook, but yeah, uh -huh. anytime that I'm doing like any of the trainings I've done, anything like that, I check in. I, I you know, I, I post where I'm at, everything like that. Am I doing photo ops with cops? No. Okay. Why? That, no, but but see, that's that's what I'm saying. Maybe that could start something if we, you have we've a, done that. So, so no, what, but I'm saying like you yeah. got officers there, and you guys are whether you know it's like an arm or you know shaking hands and saying, uh -huh. look, I mean, no, no, okay. Brandon. So here's, see, I, I mean, I'm so I'm, I'm lost on that part. So why, why you want me to hug somebody uh -huh. who's saying fuck you to me? Because well, they're not all doing that. Well, so, we just need to come uh -huh. up with a, like a listen, solution. Listen. Like we can sit right, here and right. complain all night. That's what we're so, here for. Come up with something. So here's the thing. So when so we have to have solutions like there right. and, and reading comments. So look, here's the thing. So hugging a cop is definitely not going to. Well, I, well, I would just. I, I, I know what you're saying. It's just yeah. start, yeah. start, 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 start relationships. Here's the thing: would we did not? Would we tell an IB an IMPD officer not to come to a meeting that we're having? No, we're not going to like ban you. But here's the thing: we have to be. We are. We are strategic. So I'm. So we're on the the um, the new community relations board for the East Side District. So. Obviously, being strategic and having a community voice within that. When it comes to solutions, so we need police officers who truly understand that things have to change. We need police officers who are in that role to start being more vocal. That's what she just she, said. Hold on. She said she would do that, but has she? Because the there was a, I remember there was a black woman, uh, she was a police officer, and she got on the news and denounced racism and white supremacy within police force. She was terminated, and she was harassed, and she was threatened. If a black woman can do that, and she's already disenfranchised, we need white officers to be more vocal. I understand there are white officers like Christine who are good officers. They would, you know... They would not stand for these things. But until white officers start coming forward in droves, then it's always going to be this blue line of protection. And the reason I say that is because when All Lives Matter came out, then Blue Lives Matter came out. Mm -hmm. That was not the first incident in Indianapolis mm -hmm. that we had that caused the disconnect. We had a hashtag called, I will always get out of my car. Correct. Now, when that happened, that situation was very volatile and very sensitive in general because a police officer was killed. However, when the response was an aggressive response, like, I will always get out of my car, any type of progress within community relations, that, I don't want to say kill it, that would be a horrible pun, but that definitely made it go two steps back. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm already living in a hot spot that somebody else designated, and I'm a tax-paying, law-abiding citizen, I live in an area that is heavily patrolled simply because of, you know, violence rates or whatever. But now you have this hashtag, this trending moment of, I will always get out of my car, as if to say, try me not. And it's like we, we need police officers to be more held accountable on calling the nonsense out within their force. We need police officers to take that step, be bold, operate in your white privilege, get in front of a press conference and say, I am an officer, I am on this side of town, I've been an officer for however many years, I denounce racism, I denounce white supremacy, we need reforms, we need training. And, and Office, uh, Chief Roach, he is bringing the Office of Equity and Inclusion um, implicit bias training, and I'm very happy to see that. But we need officers, because the chief is going to, he has to be political. An officer who works with other officers can have way more of an impact if they would start speaking out more and saying, I, I'm not supporting this. This does not reflect all officers. So until that happens, hugging a cop is great for optics, but action is what the community is actually looking for. Well, but, I have a question with the, towards action, though. Right. But, I have a question ahead. for the, you guys both live in the 10th and Rule mm -hmm. area, and you're saying that it's saturated and mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, crime rate is high. So if we, what, what is your suggestion if we decide, okay, um, we're going to take 50% of the officers out of there? 
Not just awesome. not just taking them out, no, but, but replacing them with resources. Well, this is this is why it's saturated, and and because the call, the call rate of that area is very very high. Yeah, very high. Mm -hmm. So it's like forces two one nine. So the officers. So it, and 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 the reason I know this is because I've I've ran over there before. So. And I get, like, they would be great, and it comes down to there's enough resources and there's not enough officers on the department. Mm -hmm. So to, to say, hey, we're going to take, you know, five officers and put them on your beat, and all they're going to do is go around and try to get community relations, you know, with mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. that is, that's not realistic with the amount of call runs that come in that area. So you're saturated with officers, I understand that, but it's run to run to run to run. But that's not what we see. And so, Most of the night. And and that's the problem is that if they were truly just going run to run, that would be one thing. But it's not that that's how it's coming down. So um, you have officers that hang out in certain areas waiting on, I guess, their next call or whatever, um, but they're not... It's always at like the marathon at 10th and Rural. And it's always specific Brookside. areas. Yeah, um, like specific spots that they hang out in. Um, and it, they're looking to catch people. And it's like, we don't need you to catch us. Like, Well, and, and, and so we have to look at, so when you look at crime and why, well, but, why but, crime but occurs. You're, then we're proactive as opposed to, see, a lot of times as police officers, we have to be reactive, like I'm coming after you've called and, and I'm not able to get the bad guy because right. you've called 911, I may be six blocks right. away. And a lot of times you want to be proactive, which means you go into these areas uh -huh. and you're looking for criminal activity to try to prevent but that's the you thing. have to be defensive. But, that, but, yeah. but, but that's the don't. thing. Okay, so like when I did my ride along um, a couple of months ago, um, you know, I, I get in and I'm I'm for those that don't know, I'm not even five feet tall. I'm really mm -hmm. short. She's four so, seven. Thank you, <laughs> and a half. Um, and so I went to put my seatbelt on in the officer's car, and I put it under under my arm because if not, it goes across, you know, like my neck. Mm -hmm. And he was like, "I would ticket you for that." Dude, if you got time to pull people over because their seatbelt isn't the way you want it to be. I mean, did he say like, that in a joking way? No, or? he was dead serious. And just like, and he was like, you know, there were some kids walking down the street and they were in the street. And he was like, I would pull them, you know, I would pull over and I would, you know, ask them for their ID and I would run them all and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you do realize there's no way for them to walk on the sidewalk because the bushes are so overgrown. Right. They can't even get down the sidewalk. So when I say we're being over-policed, that's what I mean. It's, it's the policing of unnecessary. It's, it's the policing of us being free, of us just living, of us just being. You know, if, if you're, you know, sitting there and you see somebody breaking into a house, I expect you to go do something. You're the cops. That's what you guys are supposed to do. If I see three black kids walking down the street, they ain't bothering nobody, but you just want to harass them because they're in the street and not on the sidewalk. Well, we got better things to police than how people well, are walking down there. That, and that's and that's what I was gonna say because it's it's not about being proactive with patrolling; it's being proactive with relationships. So there's a model of um, community building called asset-based community development, mm -hmm. and so that requires you to look through an asset-based lens, not a deficit lens. Mm -hmm. So you have officers who don't live on the Near East Side that are looking at 46201, which has the highest number of abandoned houses and has all these other crime issues, but if you have an officer that knows that area and knows the assets within that area, not the gentrified assets, not Poe's run, but like you have local owned organizations, you have uh, grandmothers who have been there for 70 years, you have people who have their ear to the streets. Proactive policing, not patrolling, but policing, should be working with those people to build relationships so you can remove 50% of the force mm -hmm. and replace them with resources. Like working with whoever, not looking at the kids at Marathon in a deficit approach that they're loitering or soliciting, but going up and talking to them like, hey, how y'all doing? Do you go to school around here? You know, what do you like to do? I promise if we start adopting this mindset, because it's not a training. So officers can go through implicit bias, racial equity, trauma-informed care training all day, get a certificate. That doesn't mean shit because they're not going to change their mindset. If folks start changing within the system to adopt this different mindset of assets and not deficits, not only will relationships be strengthened, but officers won't be looking through that jaded lens of, I'm always on defense, I'm always having to be proactive or reactive with patrolling. They will be able to look at it, 
there's 17 year old whoever you know, I know he's had some issues but I know that his mom just got arrested he just had a DCS case filed he's got a, a child at home he needs help so I could get him for loitering soliciting and jaywalking but let me just go hug him let me go see how he's doing and I know that people say police officers are not social workers. You are social workers. Oh, absolutely social workers. You are absolutely, you are everything encompassed within a support provider mentality. But you have to start looking at things through asset based focuses, or everything is going to be negative. Everything is an assumption that you're up to something. And Instead I, of up to something, why can't you be working towards something? And I think that you guys have to understand that there is this divide here. And you're going to have to be able to take some of the anger, frustration and things and just be okay with that. Just like when, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a property manager. That's what I do for a living. Um, you know, when somebody's heat isn't working and their hot water isn't working and everything. Is it, gr is it fun that they're cussing me out and losing their mind and you better get this fixed and blah, blah, blah. No, but I just take that and, and understand that they're frustrated because they don't have hot water or they don't have, you know, what they need. Mm -hmm. When people don't have their basic needs they, met, frustration, nice, anger, though. all of that's going to come. So when you guys are dealing with people as officers, you're going to have to be able to de-escalate situations. And a lot of times officers escalate a situation instead of doing the opposite. I do agree with that. And... and, and in parts because one thing that I realize when it comes to like black people and when things happen we get emotionally crazy to the point where you might think that I better lay him down or arrest him because I don't know what he's going to do and I've seen situations like that of, with the, the fear of black men. there was yeah there was a um, situation where a kid or, or a guy was doing something with the uh, you know on the wall oh you guys will probably remember mm -hmm. this but and then the kid was walking past and he loitered he might mm -hmm. be eight or nine years old and the guy grabbed him and whatever you know mm -hmm. and then his he went home told his mom his mom came back pissed like why are you touching my kid and all this yep. the officer that showed uh -huh. up instead of understanding that this mom is distraught because right. some man put his hands on her right. the guy who actually committed the offense got off scotch-free and she was arrested so and, and in that instance I, I, I noticed and understood her frustration because wouldn't you be pissed if you found out that some random person put their mm -hmm. hands on on your kid not that the kid was killing somebody he dropped he threw some trash from the ground I was like, hey you shouldn't do that you know there's a way to mm -hmm. approach a person but not grabbing the kid but saying hey kid you know hey you know take care of the earth and you know there's ways to approach people so for the officer to come up and immediately try to de-escalate it by being disrespectful, it was totally, it wasn't, hey, man, let me, I understand, let me talk to you. She's going to be emotional, you know, and a lot of times black folks are very emotional when it comes to things like that, even being arrested, because we're automatically thinking like, you stop me. Right. I gotta, I gotta go home. I gotta go to work tomorrow. You know, there's so many things going on through your head, and you just don't have time to get arrested for something where it's like a tail light. You know, so I can understand what you're saying with stuff like that. There possibly needs to be some training surrounding that aspect of people being emotional because black folks are definitely emotional. There's actually a, I was uh, having a conversation with a couple of other people, and we go really deep sometimes, and we were talking about how. Most black folks, because of how the, the past till now, and there's some remnants of that still, going through a, a PTSD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, the, this is the same as somebody going to war and coming home. That's when real. you see this stuff and you become desensitized to it, not only in your neighborhood, but you see it on TV, mm -hmm. it kind of desensitizes you and gives you a traumatic experience. So your experience when you encounter officers or people is totally different than someone who doesn't encounter that every day and, and imagine having uh, and that's why I said it's all about optics so there was a, a research report that came out um, I think in 2011 through the Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute and it said that young men of color specifically teenagers and young adults who live in areas of high crime or concentrated urban areas in general sure. have higher levels of PTSD than Afghanistan vets. Coming. Absolutely. So you have, cause, so I work in a day reporting program. So I work with kids who just literally got out of detention. Mm -hmm. So if I have a 17 year old, he has uh, an adverse childhood experience of nine out of 10. If he is in his home and he has had multiple people in his family killed, he's had multiple people in his family arrested, 
drug overdoses, abuse, his brain development is absolutely not prepared to be rational with a police officer who is saying, at gunpoint, get on the ground. And we expect for young people specifically to respond that way, but not even young people, people in general. There's not enough training on these things that could definitely impact that relationship. There's more training on use of force than there is on trauma-informed care or how to deal with mental health challenges. That has to change. If we're putting, that's like this country, we spend more money on military than we do education. If we continue to do that on a macro and micro levels, nothing will change. So we're telling officers, you we're going to invest more time and money into you on how to shoot people than how to deal with a kid who has an A score of 9 out of 10. That lets us know as a system and as an institution where the priorities are. So that's why we say we have to deconstruct these institutions or we're not going to have changes. We can have all the great white cops in America denounce racism. But until systems change from within, the same outcomes are going to happen. You can't expect for a 17-year-old who has all this trauma to say, you're right, I'm going to comply. Let me put my hands behind my back. You are an immediate fight, flight, or freeze threat. And I don't blame that kid. That's justified. Okay. Christine, do you have any, um, you, you, you were on the force 20 plus years, so you've seen the training go from, you know, when you started to now. Have there been any changes to how that training is, or is it essentially the same? And what um, do you think should change if, the, if, if it hasn't? Well, I think there has been some changes. I know there's, you know, cultural education going through the recruits have to in the academy. Okay. Um, I think that they're just now starting um, probably in the last uh, three-ish years to provide mental mm -hmm. um, okay. health training, which I completely agree because – this city, and along with other cities, is horrible mm -hmm. with mental um, health. I mm -hmm. mean, there's nowhere to, you know, and I think there's no no database that says. Well, hey, there's nowhere there's nowhere to take them. So if, if I'm at a run of a disturbance mm -hmm. and, and trying to articulate, I guess they're, they're trying to train us to be able to articulate because when somebody has a mental issue, um, you know, I don't know that when I look at right. you, you right. know. And if you're acting, and if you're acting crazy, or you're or you're violent, right. or whatever. So I mean, I absolutely agree that that there's that we need, and it's starting with, with training to try to d distinguish. You know, is this guy you know bipolar or schizophrenic, right. or right. is he just being uncooperative? And that's a fine line because it right. it can become sure. extremely extremely dangerous. Because someone with mental disability could also be dangerous as oh, well, yeah. depending I mean, on I, what I they was have. Not you know long ago in a fight with somebody and he was tased three times it didn't phase him right um and i ended up getting hurt another officer ended up getting hurt but at the end of the day after it went to court and everything he was he had mental mm -hmm. you know problems and didn't take his medication that sure. day and you know i didn't know that when i was dealing with him yeah um so yeah and and i think that they are making attempts but you know w there's nowhere to take so if i'm on a disturbance with someone who's who's escalating and may hurt somebody or or, or could be um, dangerous to the public, I don't, there's not any options. Mm. Like, you know, jail. central state's gone, there's jail or there's what we call an immediate detention, right. which is, I, I'm arresting you, but not really. I'm, mm. lit, I'm saying you need to go to the hospital, mm -hmm. which is like 24 hours, if that, mm -hmm. you know, to try mm -hmm. to de-escalate this problem. Um, because they're, you know, it, they don't necessarily have committed a crime, but I can't really leave because it's escalated. So it puts right. us in a in a difficult situation. Sure. And I, so I think I absolutely agree with the mental health. As far as the training, it has changed. I mean, it has. And I think that, um, you know, all of this conversation is is really, really good. And, and yeah. I agree, you know, with a lot of it that there has to be some form of... of uh, police relations with the community. Sure. Um, I personally, the officers that I have been around, and, and maybe I've just been really blessed, you know, and I think corrupt officers hang with corrupt officers because sure. if they're going to hang with good officers, we're going to be like, what do you, you know? Right. So right. I think, they know who you know, to hang with. Yeah, they know who to hang with. And I've been very blessed mm -hmm. in that. And I think, you know, I've spent 22 years de escalating situations because sure. most of the time I'm dealing with people that are bigger than me or mm -hmm. stronger than me. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I really want to do is get into right, a fight. Right. You, be, yeah. you know, and I think that there could be, you know, a, a lot of training. And I think the community and, and the police department is making attempts. Now, will it be quick? No, absolutely not. 
you know, be quick, or all of these problems be, you know, fixed quickly. I think that, I think Chief Roach is trying to be transparent, um, but I'm sure that there's, you know, obviously views that, that he isn't. Um, but, you know, I just think that there's a way to go about it. We can talk about it calmly. I know that you haven't had good experiences, but, you know, not all of us are going to, you know, tr mistreat you. It, it just, it, you know, we're not a police department like that, and I know, and but we're not perfect, you know, just like your community is not perfect, and you're not perfect, and all these things, and you know, so I just think that it just comes to a point where you, you know, you, you try to do the best that you can, and you have these discussions, and you, you know, you get with people, and it, it to try to make, just step up, like step up and try to do the right thing. I think thing. it's important to also understand, though, that even if she would have had all perfect experiences with the police it still doesn't change the fact that the policing as a system and institution is still corrupt and so we because when we get into who's had good experiences who's had bad experiences that treads the line of being respectable and i think it's really important to understand that no matter if somebody has a good experience or a bad experience the focus is on the institution and how it needs to change not your individual experience this is the same conversation about individual officers i personally like kendall um, I know a lot of people have issues with him, but I've worked with him for a long time, have a good relationship with him. But the fact that I like him as an individual, I still hold him accountable to the system he works for because that system is still corrupt. And so I think we have to make sure that we are able to look at things through that duality lens of micro or individual and then macro and system because you can like an individual officer and you can absolutely detest the system they work for. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. But I think it has to start with the individual. I mean, it has to start with each individual that's going to say, okay, I'm going to be the police and, and this is how I'm going to treat you and, you know, and try to do the job to your best ability. You know, I think it absolutely has to start with the individual. I think, you know, there are some things in the, in the, in the police department that absolutely could be changed. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with the term corrupt. Because I feel like that term it means everything in the police department is corrupt, um, is. and I well I, I don't agree. I mean I don't agree with it because I think that for you know for a long I've seen officers do things the right way and and make influences and impacts on people every single day that that nobody sees. I mean nobody it's it's never on the news. It's never you know nobody sees it in an eight and a half hour shift that mm -hmm. you know. Officers are doing things all of the time, have and you, I think go unnoticed. Um, you know, so I think it just absolutely has to start. But I think the word corrupt with this entire, I just think that it encompasses everything about the police department is corrupt, and I and I can't agree. As with an that. institution, I, it is though. Like, and I would, and I would definitely recommend that you watch Thirteenth and Documentary. That's how I was going to say by Thirteenth on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, the new Jim Crow, based on the Thirteenth um, Amendment. Yeah, burning down the house, which is about juvenile delinquency. Like there are a lot of resources out there that you can definitely watch, and 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 the reason we say corrupt is because it is corrupt as a system. Like there, it's it. The facts are that in law enforcement, people of color are targeted at disproportionate rates for arrest, for um, stop and frisk, even though it's technically not even legal. Um, like the it, the facts are out there patrol just random traffic stops so when i say corrupt it's because there is a certain demographic of our society that is still treated disproportionately inferior because of what they look like even though we, we say that it's not corrupt even though we say justice is blind it's not and with policing it definitely is not like they're the facts are there. So. And I, I think it's important for us to understand that just because we say the, the system is corrupt doesn't mean that good things don't happen within that system still. Like, yes, the system is corrupt. Yes, I mean, policing in and of itself, the way it is distributed is corrupt. However, you on your shift tomorrow might do worlds of good for a specific person. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that that the action that you did that really right. helped somebody is, you know, corrupt as well. I mean, you can have good actions within exactly. a corrupt system, right. you know? And so, and just like you can have good people that work in a corrupt system, right. okay. um, you know, like a, a lot of people say our government is corrupt. Does that mean Andre Carson is a corrupt person and, and everybody should hate him and blah, 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 blah? No, I love Andre Carson. Andre Carson is like one of my best, you know, I love him. 
but our government is corrupt. What he about happens uh, to work Bernie in Sanders? It. He works in a system that is corrupt. Our our government is corrupt. So should I work with like if if Bernie Sanders were were you know were here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, knowing that you believe that the government is corrupt, mm -hmm. should I work with Bernie Sanders? I mean, that's not if, you. If, I can't if, tell you what you oh, should oh, do. No. Well, I'm, but I'm I can tell saying. you what I do, and I can tell you what I do is what I do is people that want to own their actions and want to look at how to change those and make mm -hmm. amends for them. I'm all about working with them. But if you want to sit here and try and pontificate that you have done nothing wrong, that there is nothing that y'all need to change, there is no conversation we can have. So that's why when I keep saying, you know, as soon as IMPD wants to embrace Black Lives Matter, every, okay, so like IMPD had Community Day um, at uh, Brookside Park um, a couple <clears throat> of months ago. And being the president of NESCO, it was my job to show up for this event because it's in the NESCO area. When I went, though, I took Black Lives Matter bracelets with me to pass out. And officers would take them, but then would say things like, I can't wear this because I'll get in trouble. Like, But Blue what? Lives Matter is appropriate, and right. then Blue Line license plates are appropriate. Or, or like you have I'm officers, confused. like I have an officer that patrols at the Speedway, and I will say this before it gets taken out of context, he is not an IMPD officer. Right. So I, I don't want to put that on IMPD and, and make them look something sure. that they're not. He is an officer for a, a, a county outside of Marion County. Um, but on the front of his officer car, the his cop car, is a license plate that has the thin blue line and the Punisher on top of it. Like, that's what y'all are? Y'all are Punishers? That's how you see yourself? And th that's a problem, that our, our, our police departments approve that to be on their cars. Once again, not IMPD. IMPD does not approve that. Mm -hmm. But other, you know, and IMPD isn't the only police force here. There are other police forces. You're just talking that, about in general. Right, that, that, yeah. that we're affected by. You know, like when I was arrested at the, at the um, uh, Trump rally, um, because when Trump was still, um, uh, he Campaign. wasn't president yet, when he was out at the state fairgrounds, I was arrested um, because because of something I said, and it was an officer that wasn't even a, a, a IMPD officer. He was from Gaston, um, and so you've got officers from from counties that aren't even anywhere close to here. I'm, I'm like, y'all even have black people where you at? Why are you trying to patrol and police and and deal with you know? I mean, Trump is very very political and very polarizing and very everything. So, I, I just think it's really important for us to understand that until IMPD is willing to say Black Lives Matter. Where can we go? I, do, I, I mean, I if do you think won't that say that Black in, Lives Matter. I do think that that's important as far as bridging the community only because Black Lives Matter has been, it's not a hate group. I don't well, care how much, thank you. Not even how much they try to implicate that it is a hate group. It is absolutely is not. There are people who hate the police. I don't get me wrong. There are some people who hate everything, but that's not Black Lives Matter. And I think that it's been associated with that based on media. Some media has turned that into that. I've seen it on different news stations. I've looked at the Black Lives Matter myself as an organization. And while I don't work for them or, you know, promote them, I can see from a distance that they're not a hate group. I mean, you can go all up and down the website and look at the people who are part of that organization and see what they're doing in those communities. And that's what you should base it on. But you can look at white, white nationalists and go to the neo-Nazi websites and you can directly see that they actually really hate people. Yeah. So right. for people to associate them on, put them on the same plane disturbs me. And I think that that is what the, what's causing the division because Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with hate. It absolutely has something to do with, you know, kind of what you, your organization is doing, which is just bringing accountability and saying that, hey, Black Lives Matter. Um, and this is a question for you in regards to um, black people are, as a whole, 13% of this nation as a population. Okay, that leaves, um, that was my math, 87% of other people. Um, but we're 13%, but the most incarcerated, the most arrested, Correct. the most, you Correct. know, everything when it comes to crime and government. It just seems like, do you feel like that there's some issue with, with being 13? How can 13% of the country be the equate most to 50, violent? Equate to 50%, 50% of, of the population that's incarcerated. So that's, right. that's a huge, Yeah, huge, so what do, you, what do you think? That's why we say the system is corrupt. Well, that's why we say that. 
And what what is your opinion on that? And and what do you think it is? Why why is that? Why are those numbers disproportionate like that? And what are the? I'm sorry. So what the so again? with 13 percent of the right. country, which leaves 87 percent of everybody else, where 50 so percent of black folks are incarcerated in the, the prison of the system. People that are incarcerated are, are black, black in the system. That's out of everybody. So with that low number of black folks in this country, why are we the most incarcerated, arrested, and, you know, everything. Why, what do you think that, why do you think that is from a police perspective? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, but isn't that something to think about? Well, like, it, you it know, absolutely you think about it, like, something <laughs> to think about. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something to think about. Um, so that's why when we say the system is corrupt, that's what we're saying. So, like, I don't think that you get up out of bed every day and you're like, you know what? I want to go arrest 10 black people today because that's what I feel like doing. I don't think you do that. I don't think you get up and you say, I want to arrest anybody today. I don't think that that's your goal in life. But I think that that America has this mindset that black people are inherently violent. So Tuesday night we had a discussion, um, a, a movie, um, Who's Streets, and we had a discussion after that. Um, and it really shows how police officers treat black people especially when like you said they're being emotional and when we're emotional it, it's it's we're treated completely different than when white people get emotional so like when white people get emotional and they bring a whole bunch of guns and they have a whole bunch of tiki torches and all this kind of stuff there were no officers anywhere to be found in any of those pictures yet don't sleep can hold a black lives matter rally that has always been peaceful we have never not one time in the three years of any of our rallies had any violence of any kind at all and we had more cops at our little don't sleep rallies than you had at the white nationalist let's tiki tr it looked like the purge i'm not even gonna lie that looked like the the purge was about to happen any moment so when when we say that this system is corrupt it's because the mindset of America is that black people are inherently violent. So as soon as an officer gets into a situation where they see something that when when you see black people being loud, now you equate that with violence. Or pockets of black people. Yes, when like when you have when you have, you know, four or five black kids walking down the street together, oh, you gotta look at them because you don't know what they might be doing. Whereas if you have four or five white kids walking down the street, it's like, oh, you know. So so I have a question. So just I guess just to be direct, do you think that racism plays a part in the criminal justice field, whether that's policing, um, going to court, trial um, disposition, the bail system. The bail system. Like, do you that. think that racism plays a part in that system itself? Oh, absolutely. And see, and I think that's that's step one. Like, you can't, in, in the great words of Jay, um, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. You can't change what you don't admit. You can't change. So if we don't admit that there's no a problem, change. we can't change. <laughs> so, um, which is why we keep over and over and over trying to get IMPD to affirm Black Lives Matter. Um, do you believe Black Lives Matter? Well, absolutely. Okay, so then I don't understand why AIMPD won't embrace Black Lives Matter because I think because as a whole, and and, and we're looking at this from you look at the IMPD organization is mm -hmm. just like a huge police force in every city. There's a huge police force, and they have a job to do. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's a teeter totter on that line where we don't want to be soft, but we want to be we want people to understand that we don't play. And, and that's the problem you, is that that that. What you just said, that is the problem. Mm -hmm. If you embrace Black Lives Matter, you're now soft. Well, then right. fine. Right. That's a problem. When right. you embrace and not I think that's killing the fear. people, yeah. that makes you soft? No, I, I think that's the fear. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, I think that you have to find representatives within IMPD that are willing to be spokes, uh, spokespeople. Absolutely. And, and say, yeah, Black Lives Matter. Okay, so or, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do what like, I've done with every other officer I've come into contact with. There's my Black Lives Matter bracelet, and I'd be happy to see you wearing it okay. in uniform. I'm not in uniform anymore. Okay. Actually, but... Okay, but, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. 
know? So like, so it's not that we're not trying to bridge that gap. We, this is what I do with every single officer. I always have multiple Black Lives Matter bracelets because I'm telling you right now, if you, well, not you because you're not in uniform anymore, but if an officer has to go up to some kids or, you know, someone and they have a Black Lives Matter bracelet on, I, I, I might not just cuss you out all of a sudden. I might, that might disarm me and be like, hold on. Let, let me wait a minute. Like right. it, it, it's step one. It's visible. Ally. You know what I'm saying? It's like if I have on a shirt that says "fuck IMPD," I guarantee you the way that you approach me is not going to be the same as if I didn't. So if you have on a Black Lives Matter bracelet, the way that you're going to to interact with people and the way that they're going to interact with you is going to let them know something completely different. And um, that's why you know. So I don't. I didn't want to interrupt, but there was a comment that just came up in the discussion, black on black and it on. is a uh, huge issue don't. with Did me. Did somebody just say BMB? Because listen, because when we talk about crime, you so we've had local organizations ten point. Just to be honest, ten point. They've they've talked about black on black crime. They've talked about stop and frisk. I need for the listeners. How many of them? There are fourteen listeners. I need people to understand there is no such thing as black on black crime. Crime by nature is intraracial and intracommunity. So if you live by other black people, by nature, that's going to be your victim. If you are white and you live in a predominantly white area, Hispanic, I agree with the that. problem is you never, ever hear white on white crime as a thing. It is always black on black crime. And so we have to quit with that narrative because the media does that. I did a research report in 2014. And I looked at all homicides where they showed a picture of the victim. I took out anybody who was um, who can like who was in the middle of a crime and they died. Ninety nine point nine percent of all black people who were victims were shown as a mugshot. There was only one white person that was shown as a mugshot. All the other white people had family photos. When we look at how crime is represented, we need local clergy to chill out. We need local politicians to chill media. out, media to chill out, oh, officers that, to yeah. chill out. We need people to quit pressing this black-on-black -black narrative because it insinuates that black people are more violent than white people. When you look at the numbers of um, the crime indexes for violent crime, it is damn near balanced. And so, but you don't hear that. Um, white people do more crime specifically in drug dealing and distribution, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, we, but you don't hear that. You always hear it relegated to a ghetto or a, a certain neighborhood. I need people to quit with this black and black <coughs> narrative because that is furthering this systemic um, ideology of white supremacy because that's where it came from. And, and it still doesn't prove that the 13% is Lord the you. most violent. It's just the most showcased in media. Well, and then not only that, like when you said media, let me let me touch on that, especially sure. because on the Aaron Bailey case, I have I have held the media to a, a very strict standard because I'm not playing mm -hmm. with y'all, and I, yeah. I'm gonna say y'all because you're media. Sure. But in the Aaron Bailey case specifically, I had um, the Associated Press, I had Indy Star, I had um, RTV Six, I had um, Wish TV Eight. Mm -hmm. I had all of these um, entities ending up having to recant what they were saying about Aaron Bailey because the the narrative that they were creating about Aaron Bailey was completely false. Mm -hmm. So you had um, reporting that um, there was an um, um, uh, altercation, there was a scuffle, and that's when they opened fire, which is a complete lie, because Aaron Bailey never even got out of that car. Um, and then they had that he was reaching for something. Well, So when I call them to task, w cite your source. Mm -hmm. That's your source that Aaron Bailey was reaching for something. Right. Then, then they're recanting everything because they don't have a source on that. They don't have a source that said that Aaron Bailey actually reached right. for something. Right. So when we keep furthering this narrative that that makes black people look like we're inherently racist, we're, or, uh, we're inherently violent, we're inherently all these things, it just it makes it so that it, it, you can't get anywhere. Right. And the media does that all the time, especially like when he was saying with you know victims, you've got victims uh, that have been disparaged in the media so greatly like when it's a white person that's committed a crime um it, he's a soccer player oh he was a uh you know a college hopeful he's this and that and everything else but when it's a black victim it was you know how many times has he been arrested or this and that you don't ever hear that when it's you know white people it's it, the disparity right. essentially there's no and we need more people especially in our communities to care more because and thank you for for what you do in regards to that because I do think that you know, in the white community they they have more people coming to bat to 
do when it comes to that. So there's a fear factor there on who you're dealing with. You know, you don't know if somebody's family is a officer, a judge. You don't know who they are. So right. I think that there's a uh, a sensitive, uh, you know, sensitive there. Because when, when uh, what's the guy? I don't even want to say his name. He shot the officer when the officer was trying to help him. So I don't know his name. I just know Luke, uh, Lieutenant I, Allen. I don't even want to. Yeah, yeah. So I don't even want to give him that that credit. But <laughs> the the fact that they the media was saying that they couldn't use a picture they, they uh, because the family didn't right. accept it. This shows you right here, like the media decided to use a picture that looked friendly. Right. That's not friendly. Because he had had a mugshot, and that's the thing. Because when I called um, Indy they Star on on the fact picture. that they had yeah. used his mugshot, they were like, "Well, he's still in the hospital. Um, he's been arrested before. There's mugshots from where right. he was arrested. Who before. accepts mugshots? Y'all can, can find those for black people all day long, but oh, when yeah. it comes to a white person, now miraculously you can't find a mugshot. Yeah, my question is how do they get those images and who accepts them if you have to ask the family right so, so you know who's given who's given access to that not that some people don't need, need to be plastered some people absolutely need to be plastered you want to make sure you know who they are but that needs to be on an equal playing field um wow this has been some great discussion i mean and we we, we have to keep doing this you know i i think that and this is why we created the gray areas because we sincerely believe that we can sit here and argue and go Twitter and, and Facebook all day long, but if we can't come to a table and have a discussion, a formal discussion about what we can do, what the next steps are, something's going to spark something in someone's brain. Even if they watch this and if the if the IMPD decide they want to watch the gray area for some reason, and they sit and, sure and, <laughs> and they sit and listen. Oh, I mean, that's fine. I mean, yeah, and they sit and listen to all the golden nuggets that's, that's been fine. dropped. Maybe that brings us closer to you know bridging the gap between officers in the community because no one wants to have that we need officers but we also need a, a, a peaceful community <laughs> and you're not going to get a piece of community if the officers aren't willing to you know come and see what's going on oftentimes it's easier to throw people at the solution and say go watch them you know like like kids go watch them go make sure they're not doing anything crazy but if you don't know those people if you're not giving them respect mm -hmm. You're not going to get anything back. And this is often why some people, and I'm sure you've been through this, Christine, where some people don't want to give up information. You know, and a lot of it is because officers have been in those neighborhoods and treated them so bad that why give up information if I'm going to die tomorrow anyway? Mm -hmm. so you see, there's no there's no, no exchange of goodness. You know, so a lot of people aren't willing to give up that information. So I give you information and then they come kill my family. I don't think I'm willing to do that. You know, especially when you guys aren't going to go get that guy, but you want information from me. So, and, and, that, and that was said here, like in in within IMPD, there it was stated that because of the lack of communication or the lack of providing right. information, that people who were victims of non-fatal gun violence, they were going to be gun, uh, the police were going to go after them, right. that they were going to be more aggressive on them. And, and that is a problem. That was another one of those benchmarks that took right. the community relationships two steps back. Because you want me to give you information, but you are not willing to offer me protection or resources. Right. We, ha we have to understand how this works. It's a give, a give, right? So, I mean, in some instances that does happen, but they have to know. I think it's, you have to be implicated or know, you know, if it's, if it's substantial substantial information and they know that these people are after you they're going to give you protection we're talking about you know people just just live in that community for years and know right. what's going on but yep. they don't want to say nothing because they've been living there for years and those people know they live there mm -hmm. so right. if anybody's giving up information who you gonna know on the block that gave up that information you know everybody else it's got to be this person mm -hmm. so it's easier in our community especially black folks for somebody to do something and know exactly who's going to tell <laughs> it's not it's not hard <laughs> So, you know, there definitely needs to be an exchange of, uh, of help on, on both sides in regards to information being passed in that aspect. So, but, man, this has been great. Um, we usually try to wrap up around 10. You know, everybody's got lives, and we can go on for, I know you got a podcast. You can probably go on. We, we can go on here for another two hours. Um, but I encourage you guys to, um, let's continue building this, absolutely. You know, if we got to exchange numbers or whatever, we have to continue building this, and we have to continue trying to bridge this gap. Doing it in ways that disrespect other people will never get us anywhere. I don't care how you do it. Um, sometimes it's unfortunate, but in America, sometimes you got to be disrespectful to get a little attention. Um, but let's 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 stop that. 
we could do it by just talking to each other, just having a formal conversation and listening, not just saying, yeah, I agree, and, and, and we, we go back to our lives. You know, and this is my problem with some march, some of the marches that have happened that I've been a part of in the past. I feel like we're marching, but then tomorrow, nobody's nobody cares about after. That's true. I, that's why I like what you guys are doing because it's not a one day thing. You guys are doing this every day, and we need more people and organizations like that that work every day to continue fighting that fight, no matter what the march is. Uh, in our community, we've been used to. Doing a march and oh, it's great, you know, million man, and we 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 accomplished something. Then everybody goes back to work. I think I think, you know, it's, I think it is important though to understand that um, a lot of the work is done behind the scenes. Sure. And so you know we do have these aesthetically pleasing marches and rallies, but there are a lot of people who are out here doing a lot of the behind the scene work, sure. like working um, to be strategic with police or contacting legislators. And that and that's what the last thing I wanted to say was. <laughs> Because I know, like, there were some uh, fellow white people, which I like to call them, on the comments. And instead of investing a lot of energy on negating certain terminologies, put that much energy into fighting the system. Sure. So be strategic. Absolutely. If you don't want to march and protest, I got you. Be a mentor. Be a tutor. Absolutely. Join uh, Read Up programming. Uh, contact Bloom Project. Like, there are ways to disrupt <clears throat> without... Marching and protesting, sure. like, be strategic. But if you, if all you can do is clamor back and forth on a Facebook, feed, but not doing you anything, you are a part of the problem. Right? I'm gonna Absolutely. Call you out. Absolutely. There it is. What we like to do is uh, closing remarks. We'll start with you, Satchwell. Um and just you know let people know again who you are, what you represent, and then how to reach you. Um, well, you can find me on Facebook, um, Satchwell Cole, um, and um, closing remarks. Um, Aaron Bailey <coughs> matters. Aaron Bailey's life mattered. Um, and we're not going to rest until we get justice for Aaron Bailey. Aaron Bailey was murdered by IMPD officers. And until they are brought to justice, um, I won't let Aaron Bailey's name out of out of our thoughts and every day. Uh, call Cotter. Um, he's up in South Bend, and we've been calling him daily uh, to let him know that we want no grand jury. Um, so Aaron Bailey, Aaron Bailey, Aaron Bailey, Aaron Bailey. Okay, thank you. Christine? Um, I'll just close with uh, thanking you guys for the opportunity to come on here again. Absolutely. I appreciate Tommy. that. And, uh, you know, I'm all about opening up my mind and opening sure. up my ears. And uh, so I just appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Meninafiles.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, last comment from me. Uh, white people, uh, we have to do better. Uh, we The onus uh, is on us when it comes to... Um, infiltrating and disrupting these systems. We created a problem. We have to create the solution. Um, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Brandon Randall. My profile picture is Black Lives Matter. Um, it's simple. Do something. Absolutely. Thanks. P. Wills. Um, I want to thank y'all for coming. Um, you know, just laying, every, you know, just laying our perspectives on the uh, table, um, bouncing off of each other. Um, I want to thank the uh, viewers for uh, watching. Um, you know, I'm going I'm to say some things really quick um, and try to be as brief as I can. <clears throat> um, I remember being 15 or 16 after a football game, being placed face first on the pavement by cops because we, we were being uh, profiled. I remember being pulled over. Um because my mother had moved in a better area than the hood. And um, she probably re uh, remembers this because she was pissed off at me because I, you know, uh, I got smart with the, uh, uh, with the uh, officers. But we were leaving a uh, mire and got pulled over and the guns were uh, drawn on us. Um, for a long time, I didn't like the cops, hated them. Because of things that I've seen uh, growing up and then just being, um, you know, face with certain things, you know, that I had to deal with personally. But I realized something, the more I dealt with people, and the more, I, you know, I looked at how my aunt helps kids, how she feeds the homeless, and she's a cop, how she goes to people's houses, even though she doesn't work a beat, but she takes time out and, and she walks down the worst streets in the city to help people. I look at what my uncle does the conversations that we've had, 
where he encouraged me to try to be a, a cop. And, and, you know, I prayed over it, went through the process, and I was in there. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I resigned for certain reasons. But I say all, you know, all of this stuff to, to say this, man, is that you might have an issue with a, a certain person or IMPD or, or whatever, but you got to be part of the change that you want to see. And if I put everybody in a, you know, in a basket because of the experiences that I've had with not only cops but white people or whatever, I wouldn't be where I am right now. I would have so much hatred within me that I would be clouded. I wouldn't even be trying to form any type of unit with anybody, whether it's white people or because I could easily say, based on history, I don't want to deal with white people. Although y'all are fighting for me, us. I could say, well, y'all are part of the system that wants to keep me down. So I'm just saying, you know, we got to look at each other. Like, I got to see myself in you and vice versa. It doesn't matter if, if it's Black Lives Matter, IMPD, whatever. If we looked at each other and understood that we are all connected, which is something I always say, this whole world would shift. Things would get better. So I just hope that people learn from this dialogue, <clears throat> you know, this whole discussion, and we can just continue to do our part in trying to bridge this gap. Because, you know, I mean, it saddens me, man. I mean, I'm, I'm hurt because, you know, I want the best for people. And I want everyone to just work together and just make this whole world a better place, period regardless of what color you are. There it is. Thank you, sir. Um, I applaud you guys for coming here and being brave. Um, you know, you, you didn't say as many as many uh, of those C words as I thought you would, but, you know, you did all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, but it, one thing showed tonight, and it's the passion that we all possess in, 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 in trying to make change. Now, we all do that in different ways and how we feel like we should, but... Mm -hmm. The most important part is that we're all here at the table trying to figure it out. And, and that's the best that you can get in this world today right. is to just simply have discussion. Let's see where we can take it. Um, continue having these discussions and hope for the better. Hope that people are able to watch and see this as opposed to what they see on the news and media, which is another reason we exist. We want people to see these kind of conversations because if you watch TV, you, you're going to get a one-sided uh, conversation based on whatever, you know, whatever leadership possesses in that, in that media company. And our uh, job here is to bring people to the table. Let's have a discussion and talk about it to see if we can figure it out together. Um, and that's all we ask asked for and you guys have done that today so i thank you for wanting to be a part of the gray area and uh, we, we hopefully we can do this again continue doing this yeah, absolutely um every month until somebody does something you know um in our capacity this is what we can do be a part of the solution you know we we don't we didn't own a news station or we couldn't we couldn't call the, the wthr and say hey can you give us 30 minutes or an hour to, to talk about this kind of stuff they're not simply not going to do that but so we created our own, and, and right. this is how we become part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be a part of the solution, we have to hit the ground. We have to get out here and create action and and progression and do it. You know, now we might have, like I said, we might have our own way of doing that. But um, if we can bring all these attitudes and passion together for the, for one purpose, we can succeed everything. So to that, I'll say thank you guys for coming. Thank thanks, you. Thanks to thank our you. viewers. Always faithful, always uh, loving on us and, and sharing our feeds and helping us out. Um, you guys motivate us. Again, we don't do this. We don't make any money off of this. This is simply voluntary. Um, you know, I just want to thank my family. Uh, I've done this on air yet. I just want to thank my family for uh, always holding me down and and wanting and just wanting the best for me. When I leave out of the door, they're just they know what I'm going to do. You know, uh, which is sit here and have these conver different conversations. And again, we're not getting paid for this or anything. So I just want to thank them uh, and P. Wills and you guys for just being a part of this. So we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Peace. Welcome to the gray area. The gray area media. We've obligated ourselves to be the voice for all communities speaking on topics that include community, religion, education, politics, technology, sports, health, and wellness. 
The Gray Area Media is a platform created by longtime friends for the sole purpose of providing our communities with the ability to voice current, past, and modern day issues. The Gray Area and its naming significance solely speaks to the area in which people shy away from speaking because of media-based constraints or contractual-based obligations. Well, I'm here to tell you, we don't do that here. So please, stay tuned in. We're going to go live in a few minutes. Don't forget, please add us as a friend on Facebook so that you can follow our live feed. And not only that, please add us on Twitter and Instagram at The Gray Area Media. Please visit our website at www.thegrayareamedialive.com. Thank you.